How far would you be willing to go to hide your darkest secret? For Kristen Rossum, she'd be willing to go pretty far. See, Kristen was a toxicologist from California who dedicated her life and her career to helping investigators solve crimes and keeping people like you and me safe from toxic chemicals. But Kristen also had a few dark secrets that she was desperate to keep hidden. It was November of 2000 when a phone call rang through to 911 dispatchers. It was Kristen and she was frantic. She just found her husband lying on the floor of their home, clutching their wedding photo, and he wasn't breathing. Kristen believed he had taken his own life. The 911 operator walked Kristen through performing CPR, but it was no use. By the time police and detectives had arrived, her husband had already lost his life. But when investigators began collecting evidence from the scene of the crime, well, things just weren't adding up. It didn't take long before they realized this man didn't take his own life, he had his life taken. Kristen Rossum was born in Memphis, Tennessee, but she didn't spend too much time here as a child. Instead, she grew up in Claremont, California, which is about 30 miles away from Los Angeles. Compared to Los Angeles, Claremont is a pretty solid place to live, and crime is relatively low in the area, all things considered. It's a perfectly reasonable place to raise a family, and that's exactly what the Rossums did. Kristen was raised alongside her two younger brothers, with her father being a college professor while her mother worked at Azusa Pacific University. For the longest time, everything seemed to be going well for the family. From outward appearances, they were your average, happy American family, living the dream, so to speak. But as Kristen reached her teenage years, well, cracks began to show, and it was clear that Kristen was struggling. In 1991, Kristen's father was offered a job as president of the Hampton Sydney College. This was a pretty major job offer, but there was only one problem. It was on the complete opposite side of the country in Virginia. Knowing that he couldn't pass up such an amazing opportunity, Kristen's dad accepted the offer, and without hesitation, the entire family uprooted and moved to Virginia. Kristen wasn't too happy about the move. Once they had arrived, her parents enrolled her in an all-girls school known as St. Catharines, and this seemed to make a bad situation worse. No sooner than Kristen began attending school here, she started getting into trouble. It started with her drinking alcohol while far too young, then escalated to her smoking cigarettes, again while she was far too young to do so legally. But again, this escalated. She then started smoking things that were highly illegal at this point in history. Remember, this is around 1991 to 1992 at this point, and it was becoming painfully obvious Kristen was not having a good time at her new school. But still, things would escalate from here. Starting at some point in 1992, Kristen's behavior got even worse, and she began experimenting with certain chemicals that are known for being life-destroying, all-consuming, and downright dangerous. We're talking Walter White level stuff. This took place when Kristen was about 16 years old. It only took a few uses for Kristen to become completely addicted and highly dependent on this chemical. Kristen would fall deeply into the trap of addiction for the next two years, with it nearly ruining her life by controlling her every move. By 1994, she decided she'd had enough of the Virginia lifestyle and she opted to move back home to California, enrolling in the University of Redlands part-time and even having accommodations on campus. At this point, Kristen was 18 years old, now legally an adult and a free woman, although she still suffered from the shackles of her addiction. We don't know for sure how much time Kristen spent in college here, but we do know that before too long, her addiction grew considerably worse, and she had to leave school as a result, with some sources suggesting she was likely kicked out due to her addiction, but this hasn't been confirmed 100%. It was around this time that Kristen met a man who completely blew her away, Greg DeVillers. Now, some people insist on pronouncing Greg's name as Devier, and others simply say it as DeVillers, but we'll just call him Greg to keep it simple. After leaving college, Kristen decided to take some time off and scheduled a vacation to Tijuana, Mexico. While here, she met Greg, an upstanding guy who could clearly see that Kristen was struggling. The story goes that Greg noticed Kristen from a distance after she had dropped her jacket. He swooped in and picked it up for her, and the two hit it off instantly. Greg could see that, in his eyes, Kristen was a good person who'd simply been dealt a bad hand. He knew from the moment they met that she'd been struggling, 
and after the two had been hanging out for a while after this, he learned of her addiction troubles. He wanted to do whatever he could to help Kristen overcome this, and if you could believe it, he actually succeeded. The two had met in December of 1994, and over the course of a few short years, with Greg's love and support, Kristen not only managed to overcome her addiction, but she also managed to re-enroll in college, this time at San Diego State University, and even graduated with honors. Needless to say, after helping her turn her life around in such a profound way, and being there for her in every step of her journey, Kristen fell deeply in love with Greg, and it was clear he felt the same way. Thus, after dating for nearly five years, the two got married in June of 1999. But their joy would be short-lived, because just a few months later, tragedy would strike. Kristen would admit to several of her friends that prior to marrying Greg, she'd started having second thoughts. She never really explained why she felt this way, but she wrote off these feelings as pre-wedding jitters and went through with the wedding anyway. But as time ticked by, it became more and more clear these thoughts were not going away. Kristen felt that she'd made a mistake. Now, Kristen admits that for the first six months of their marriage, the two were perfectly happy. But as more and more time passed by, feelings began to fade, and Kristen began to regret her decision to marry Greg. Rather than reach out for help or seek professional guidance to help resolve this, Kristen decided, to put it rather plainly, she'd just get what she wanted somewhere else, and her husband was none the wiser. By this point, Kristen had been hired as a toxicologist for the San Diego Medical Examiner's Office. Her new job began to consume more and more of her time, and Greg began to grow concerned. He knew his wife had a very important job, but as time passed by, she was spending more and more time at work and less time at home and this trend was only getting worse as time went on. But it became clear pretty quickly that Kristen wasn't just working long hours. No, there was much more to the story than that. By June of 2000, Greg and Kristen had been married for less than a year when she began an affair with her boss, Michael Robertson, the head of the toxicology lab. Kristen says that soon after the affair began, she came clean with Greg and let him know exactly what was going on. But for the life of me, I can't figure out why she did this, because she didn't even break up with Michael, nor did she end things with Greg. She continued seeing Michael behind Greg's back for months, so why bother telling him if you're not going to end one of the two relationships? Whatever her reasoning was, Kristen says that Greg was naturally devastated. She said he spent a period of about two days just lying in bed, speaking to no one. After the fog had cleared, Greg mustered up the courage to call Michael at home, confronting him about the affair and demanding that the two end their relationship immediately. Michael refused. The affair would continue for several more months, and by October of that year, not only had Kristen effectively ruined their marriage, but she also threw away five years of recovery, falling back into the deadly grasp of addiction harder than she ever had before. This brings us to November of 2000. After the affair had gone on for about four or five months, Greg decided enough was enough. Once he learned that Kristen had fallen back into her addiction, he gave her an ultimatum. Quit your job and stay home, or I'll inform the medical examiner's office about both your affair and your addiction. Kristen was blindsided. She didn't know what to do. In some way, it seems as though she still may have loved Greg. I mean, she had to if she refused to leave him after all this. But also, she was clearly swept away by Michael and she couldn't stand the thought of not seeing him anymore. To top this off, she certainly didn't want to leave her job as a toxicologist. So what was she to do? Well, in November of 2000, Kristen's future became ever more clear, and many of her problems, well, they vanished. That's because at 9.15 p.m. on November 6th, Kristen called 911. She'd found Greg passed out on the floor, unresponsive. Kristen phoned 911 that evening and announced to the operator that her husband had taken his own life. The operator walked Kristen through performing CPR, but it didn't do any good. Greg was already gone. By the time paramedics arrived, he was declared deceased at the scene. By this point, Kristen and Greg had been married for only about 17 months, putting a sudden and tragic end to an incredibly short marriage that, for Greg, was the love he'd been waiting his whole life for. When police questioned Kristen about what had taken place that evening, she explained that Greg had been acting very groggy and sluggish all day. He'd also been unusually nervous in the days leading up to this. 
She thought that he'd just been dealing with the effects of some cold medicine he'd taken, combined with the stress of their failing marriage. But this clearly wasn't the case. Kristen says that she decided to take a bath that night. When she emerged from the bath, she found Greg on the floor of his bedroom, covered in rose petals, clinging to a photo from the couple's wedding day. Nearby, investigators found crumpled up pages of Kristen's diary, but it's not clear what these pages had written on them or why Greg would have been in possession of them. Investigators immediately made the comment, though, that the crime scene was just like a scene from the film American Beauty. But at this point, they had no reason to suspect that anything was amiss. Now, Kristen had initially told detectives that Greg was completely sober that evening, but later on, she explained that he'd taken cough medicine. Then she suggested to a nurse at the hospital that she believed he may have taken oxycodone, though we don't know where he would have gotten this or why he would have taken it. She then suggested to this nurse that he may have actually overdosed on oxycodone. When police continued speaking with Kristen over the coming hours, she finally revealed she believed Greg was upset about their failing marriage, and this may have driven him to take his own life by mixing cough medicine and oxycodone, but this was purely a guess. She then took things a step further and said that the rose petals that were found around his body were from a set of roses Greg purchased for her birthday a little over a week prior. She said she believed he used these petals from one of the roses to represent their failing marriage. When Greg's family learned of his passing, well, that's when things took a completely different direction. Greg's family simply couldn't imagine that he would take his own life. Yes, his marriage was over, but they didn't believe he was the kind of person who would throw his life away because his wife had been unfaithful. Greg's family loudly voiced their concern to the investigative team, and before long, they weren't the only ones who were suspicious. Just two days after Greg lost his life, another call came into the local police station. This time, it was from one of Kristen's co-workers, Russ Lowe. Russ had learned of the affair that Kristen had been having with their boss, Michael and he believed there was much more to the story than Kristen was letting on. For detectives, this was all the information they needed to alter the course of their investigation. And that's when police started to look much more closely at the relationship between Michael and Kristen. According to Russ, several of the workers at the lab knew about Kristen's affair with Michael. As it would turn out, Michael was married as well, but as far as I can tell, his wife was blissfully unaware of his affair with Kristen. Many of the employees at the lab were concerned that Kristen would be getting preferential treatment, but there wasn't much they could do about the situation without putting their own careers on the line by speaking out. About a month passed by after Greg lost his life, and once police came public with the information about the affair and Kristen's addiction, both Michael and Kristen were fired from the San Diego Medical Examiner's Office effective immediately. Kristen was fired for concealing her addiction, and Michael was fired for having a relationship with the coworker. But that was only the tip of the iceberg, because just a few weeks after this, the results of Greg's autopsy came back. And it wasn't pretty. The San Diego Medical Examiner's Office had outsourced Greg's autopsy to avoid a conflict of interest. So when the results came back a few weeks later, everyone was taken aback by what had been found. After a careful forensic analysis of Greg's body, the medical examiner determined that Greg had passed away from a fentanyl overdose, an incredibly powerful painkiller. When questioned about this, Kristen claimed that Greg had been seriously depressed in the weeks leading up to his passing, suggesting he may have started using this medication as a way to cope. Kristen's father even spoke up and said that he noticed Greg had been drinking heavily and had done so on the night that he lost his life as well. Now, it's safe to assume that both of these statements were likely true. I mean, after all, Greg had just learned about his wife's affair, something that would lead many people to drink. The depression from the situation is pretty natural as well. But Greg's family were adamant he was not one to cope with his emotions by turning to medication or alcohol. It just wasn't the kind of person he was. As police continued to investigate the situation, they learned about a strange phone call that Kristen had made on the day Greg lost his life. Kristen had taken the liberty of calling into Greg's office to let his co-workers know he wouldn't be showing up for work that day because he wasn't feeling well. Why Greg wouldn't have made this call himself, the world may never know. It was also reported by Kristen's co-workers that at around 9 a.m. that morning, she was spotted crying in Michael's office, the man that she'd been having the affair with. No one knows why she was doing this, but it was clear something strange was going on. By this point, police were more than just a little bit suspicious of Kristen. 
They called her in for questioning and confronted her about what they'd found in Greg's toxicology report. They asked Kristen if she had any idea how Greg would have been able to get a hold of fentanyl, but Kristen insisted she had no clue. But here's the thing. Being a toxicologist, Kristen would have had virtually limitless access to this chemical, and the implications here are pretty clear. Soon after, police also learned about the ultimatum that Greg had given to Kristen. Quit your job or I'll tell the world what you've done. Needless to say, things were not looking good. This information, combined with Kristen's access to the very chemical that claimed her husband's life, led police to officially announce that they believed Kristen was responsible for Greg's demise. On June 25th, 2001, Kristen was officially charged. But there's one final twist here that really sends the case into overdrive. After learning that their daughter was going to be sent to trial, Kristen's parents mortgaged their home to raise money for Kristen's bail, which was set at $1.25 million. The only problem was, after all this money was raised for bail, the family had nothing left over to hire Kristen a private attorney, which meant she would be forced to accept a public defender. At trial, Kristen told a pretty clear story of what she believed unfolded that day. According to her version of events, Greg had been home sick from work that day. She said she noticed him slurring his speech and acting sluggish all morning, so she took it upon herself to call his office and let them know that he'd be staying home that day. She says that she returned home around noon to check up on him and make him some soup, returning to work shortly thereafter and then returning home once again around 7 p.m. When she got back home that evening, Greg was perfectly fine. He was still sick, but he wasn't any worse off than he was earlier that day. This is when she decided to take a bath and relax for a while. But when she emerged from the bathroom, she found the crime scene. Greg lying on the floor, clutching their wedding photo, surrounded by rose petals. But the prosecution had a much different version of events to share. According to their investigation, about 90% of Kristen's story simply wasn't true. They believe that Kristen had concocted the crimes against her husband all the way back on November 2nd, four days before he lost his life. They believe that November 2nd is the date in which Greg gave Kristen the ultimatum. Quit your job or I'll ruin your career and take your boss down with you. In the four days leading up to the crime, the prosecution believes that Kristen concocted her plot against Greg, procured the fentanyl that would be used to take his life, and staged the whole thing to look like Greg had taken his own life. To make matters worse, in the hours leading up to Greg's demise, police learned through Kristen's phone records that she'd called Michael repeatedly, over and over again, suggesting to some people that Michael may have played a role in masterminding this plan, and maybe even helped Kristen access the chemicals used to take Greg's life, though Michael was never actually convicted of anything. If this weren't bad enough, the prosecutors also claimed that Kristen was fueling her own addiction using chemicals stolen from the lab as well. But here's where things get incredibly interesting. Police found one final piece of evidence against Kristen, one final nail in her coffin, so to speak, the rose petals. Kristen claimed that the rose petals that covered Greg's body came from a rose that he'd bought for her birthday about a week or so prior. She also claimed that on the day Greg lost his life, she returned home shortly after noon, around 12.45 p.m., to check up on Greg and make him some soup. But would you believe that when police were searching through CCTV footage from that day, they found footage of Kristen at a local grocery store at 12.42 p.m., purchasing a single rose that she would later shred on top of Greg's body. Rather obviously, Kristen was found guilty, but Michael never faced any charges. Kristen was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole and was given a $10,000 fine on top of this. Four years later, in 2006, Kristen was fined once again, this time with $100 million in a wrongful death lawsuit that was filed by Greg's family. San Diego County then added additional fines of $1.5 million, now, these fines were later significantly lowered by a judge, and it appears that Kristen now only owes about $14.5 million in total. But she obviously has no way of ever paying this much money back, and she'll be working it off in prison until her days are done. The only thing that remains unclear in this case is exactly how Kristen managed to poison Greg. She mentioned making him soup for lunch that day, and assuming this aspect of the story is true, it's possible she put the chemical in his soup. But if that were true, then you'd have to wonder how he managed to live up until 9 p.m. that evening. This medication works incredibly quickly, 
so he likely would have been down in a matter of minutes, not hours. The only other possibility I can think of is that she must have slipped it to him somehow immediately before she got in the bath that evening, then staged the scene of the crime when she got out, but we really don't know. As far as I can tell, Kristen has never explained this aspect of the story because she still insists that she's innocent. Kristen has appealed her sentencing multiple times, but each and every appeal has been denied. As it stands, Kristen is still in prison and will likely remain there for the rest of her life. In the aftermath of this case, Greg's family has done everything they can to try to make sure that Kristen gets what she deserves. And it seems like they're doing a great job at this. If you remember, they won a lawsuit for $100 million against Kristen. According to the family's attorney, they didn't do this because they actually believed they would see that money one day. Instead, they did this because they didn't want Kristen to be able to sell her story for profit. I'm sure you already know this, but companies like Netflix and various others love to swoop in and pay these criminals and monsters for the rights to tell their stories in movie form or even in a documentary. Greg's family wanted to make sure that if Kristen ever did this, she wouldn't see a single cent of this money purely because she's in such a tremendous amount of debt. To add to this, Greg's family didn't even plan on suing Kristen for 100 million. They only asked for 50 million, but the jury decided that Kristen's story was worth a minimum of 60 million. So they decided to double the payout to 100 million. I honestly had no idea that a jury had the authority to do such a thing. So if there is any silver lining to this case, Kristen has certainly been dealt with. And Greg's family has ensured that no matter what she does, even if she is released from prison one day by some miracle, they'll be right there to remind her of the awful torment that she put their family through. Kristen will never, ever live this down. And this case is an excellent example of incredible detective work and the judicial system operating at its best. No amount of money or court drama will ever bring Greg back. And the damage Kristen has done to Greg's family, well, it's irreparable. But maybe in some way, knowing that Kristen's life is essentially over, maybe this can bring them some level of peace. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.